We'll start things off with the AAA team, the Sacramento Rivercats, taking on the Fresno Grizzlies here at Oak Street Park. Carson Fulmer, the right-hander, getting the start for the Rivercats, has a very good year in AAA so far, while he'll be taking on Austin Voff, making his ninth start for Fresno. Take a look at the Rivercats lineup, big 2-3-4 of Bart, Beer, and Joe, and then take a look at the Fresno Grizzlies lineup. Start things off, bottom half of the first inning, Abreu goes down, swinging, drop third strike Bart, Bart tosses over to first base after that it would be Marmalejos who pops up into foul territory and we move on to the top of the second where J Connor Joe comes to the plate for the River Cats and he launches a 1-2 pitch into the left field seats a no doubt home run for Connor Joe and the River Cats strike first in this one they're up one nothing move on to the bottom of the second now where the Grizzlies are at the plate and Carter Keyboom is going to draw himself a walk. After that, it brings up Reynolds, who's going to sneak one past the first baseman on the right side of the infield. And then with two outs, Rocky Gale takes what should have been strike called three and instead gets another curveball. This one was a bit hanging, and he's going to knock that one off the left field foul pole. Rocky Gale puts Fresno up 3-1 to one, thanks to a three-run shot. Then later in the game, bottom of the third, Abreu strikes out after him, brings up Marmalejos, 1-2 count to him. He is also going down swinging. Top of the fourth now, Chris Shaw at the plate gets some good wood on this one, sends it a long way to right field, right fielder back at the wall, gives it a leap, and he hauls it back in, brings it back into the field of play. Let's take another look at this one. At the wall, jumps up, makes the grab, very nice play by the right fielder of the Grizzlies. So top six now, and Luis Sardina is going to draw himself a walk. And then Joey Bart, two-run shot, ties the game here at three. Joey Bart showing off why he is one of the top prospects in all of baseball. Hitting the two-run shot, tying the game. Later in the top of the six, Seth Beer comes to the plate, hits a ball down the right field line. It's going to be a base knock as the right fielder got to it quickly to hold him to a single. And then Connor Joe comes up, hits a ball to center field. It'll land in front of the center fielder for a base knock as well. So back-to-back -back singles for the River Cats. That would end Voth's day as Nick Green comes out of the pen. The Submariner gets a quick out, and then he would get Zach Green and go around into an inning-ending 4-6-3 double play. On to the bottom half of the sixth inning now where Marmalejos gets a ball past the first baseman into right field for a base knock. Bobby Parnell would then come on to relieve Carson Fulmer with one out and a runner on first. A ball is hit up the middle for a base knock. So it's going to be first and third as the runner goes all the way to third base. Somehow gets in there before the throw. So runners on the corners with one out. Brings up Gage Canning, who bloops a ball into left field. It's going to be an easy RBI single to give the Grizzlies a 4-3 lead. Top of the eighth now, Justin Miller comes on for Fresno. Joey Bart, third baseman, was hugging the line, so he's able to sneak it past him into left field for a single. Then with two ats, Connor Joe. Left field, over the fence, another home run for Connor Joe. His second of the game, this one gives them a lead yet again. His ninth on the season, 5-4 ball game. Carter Caps, who has been very impressive in AAA, comes on, strikes out Rocky Gale with a 99-mile-an-hour fastball, and then he would get a pop-up to shallow left field by the pinch hitter Hanser Alberto, and it's going to be an easy Ninth inning for Carter Caps and the Sacramento River Cats win this game 5-4 over the Fresno Grizzlies. Connor Joe, big day at the plate, two home runs. He was three for four on the day. Joey Bart, two for four with a home run, two runs driven in. Luis Sardina, also two for three on the day. But let's take a closer look at some of the players throughout our AAA roster. So we'll start things off with the guy who actually had the best game today, and that was Connor Joe. He has been the best bat on the Rivercats this season so far, an 828 OPS. 
If he continues hitting like this, like I said in the offseason video, he might end up forcing his way onto a roster in the big leagues because you can't deny the guy if he's going to hit like this at every level. It just doesn't matter if he can hit like this at the big leagues. Luis Sardina has done surprisingly well at the plate this year. I signed him just being a AAA shortstop, but he's done pretty well. He's the second best bat, second highest team, second highest OPS on the team with an 802. I still don't think he'll be in the major leagues unless something happens, but it is nice to see that he is doing well at the AAA level. And then here's where things start to drop off. Avellino, only a 672 OPS on the year so far. Joey Bart, also not the greatest start to the year, a 641. Seth Beer, definitely not what you like to see, a sub 600 OPS on a guy who's really only skill is his bat that's his only tool so you definitely want to you don't want to see him hitting a, a sub 600 ops but we are still early on in the season so he does have plenty of time to turn it around Casey Gillespie had a good year for us in AAA last year, ended up getting up in September call-ups to the big leagues, and he has not gotten off to the best start in AAA so far, but once again, it is early, so he can improve upon that 607 OPS. Chris Shaw has been terrible. Now, he is a guy who was terrible when he got called up last year at the Major League level, and he did not just play in September. He played a decent amount of time in the big leagues last year, and he was terrible the entire time and he has continued being terrible in AAA. So Chris Shaw, he's not a highly tatted prospect. I believe he's like 26 or 27 already. So his future with the organization is not looking that great. He might be involved in like a minor leaguer for minor leaguer trade at some point in this season, or we might just move on from him in the offseason. We'll have to see what happens as time goes on. Zach Green has been very bad offensively so far this season. He was definitely the best bat on our AA team last year. He had a way above 800 OPS, and I said in the video last year that if he keeps hitting like this, I mean, who knows, maybe he'll force his way into our plans. Right now, we could use a first baseman as Tyler Austin's not exactly getting the job done there. Like I said, he's been playing very poorly in AAA, but he has been playing third base in AAA since Gillespie's been playing first. But even then, he's still not getting the job done. On the pitching side of things in AAA, we have quite a few pitchers who are doing exceptionally well. Andrew Suarez has a 2.04 ERA, 2.22 FIP in 57 and a third innings pitched. He's a guy who, yeah, he dominates AAA whenever he's down here, but I mean, he was up in the big leagues for a bit last year. Did not look good in any of his appearances, especially the one start he made that I had in the video where he was just walking people left and right. It was not a pretty start. So he's a guy who, yeah, his ratings are probably pretty decent, and he does well in AAA, but I'm not sure if he really has a future in for us at the Major League level. So he's another guy who could be involved in either a minor leaguer for minor leaguer trade or like a minor leaguer and him being sent to a team that could use a starting pitcher, and then he would go to the big leagues for them. Also, Carson Fulmer, as you saw in his stats when he started the game, he is having a very good year in AAA. He has an 072 ERA, a 277 FIP, in 47 and two thirds innings pitched. He has 50 strikeouts. And I mean, anytime you have an ERA under one, you know you're absolutely shoving at that level. So Carson Fulmer is definitely a guy who, if he keeps pitching like this, is going to end up at the big league roster sooner than later. Tyler Rogers is the right-handed submariner that we have on our pitching staff. He's having a pretty good start to the year. He's a guy who I said in the last minor league update video that he's a guy who could be a decent bullpen piece for us in the future. I doubt he'll ever get looks as a starter at the major league level since we already have so many good starting pitching prospects that he's not really looked at at that position, but he could be a guy who could be serviceable in the big leagues for a reliever role. Sean Anderson having a good start to the year in AAA as well, 2.63 ERA, 3.19 FIP in 51 and a third innings pitched. He will 1000% be back in the big leagues at some point in this season. He ended last year in our rotation as a member of the rotation in the September call-ups. He's going to be back at some point in 2020. It's just a matter of when a spot opens up. Maybe someone pitches poorly. Maybe it won't be until we can start making trades. But at some point, he is going to be on the Major League roster. Sean Jelly, we recently did a prospect profile for him. He's a guy who's having a decent start to the year in AAA as well. And then Carter Caps has by far been the best reliever on our AAA team, as you saw in the actual video. He's been our closer. He leads the Pacific Coast League in saves, and he has not given up an earned run yet in AAA. So, I mean, 
the guy has pitched something like 18, 19 innings and hasn't given up a single earned run, that's pretty good for a reliever. And I would say that he's going to be in the big leagues very, very soon because we have a couple guys in the bullpen who aren't pitching up to par, so one guy could get sent down and Carter Caps would be the first guy to get called up. Now down to Double A to take a look at the Richmond Flying Squirrels taking on the Altoona Curve here at Barnes Canyon Ballpark. Sterling Sharp, the right-hander who came over in the Gerardo Parra and Tony Watson trade last year, gets the nod for Richmond. And opposing him will be another right-hander in Gage Hins. Take a look at the Altoona Curve lineup. And then, of course, the Richmond Flying Squirrels lineup as well. We'll start things off bottom half of the first inning. Sharp on the hill gives up a hit to Reyes. Right center field, that's going to be a base knock to lead off the game for him. And then after that, it brings up Bay, who's going to chop one over to the shortstop. Nick Allen goes to second with it. They cannot double him up, so Bay reaches on a fielder's choice. So runner on first with one out as a ball is going to be hit into right center field. That'll get past Mark Strange in center field. And it's going to be enough to be an RBI triple for Colvin. And it's a 1-0 Altoona lead. Two outs in the inning now as Mitchell would hit a ball down the left field line. Just barely stays fair. And it's now a 2-0 lead for the curve. Top half of the second, Tyler Stevenson gets some good wood on this one. Carries out the deep left field, but it's going to be caught at the track. Then later in the top of the second, Elliot Ramos hits a ball into the gap. Shortstop tries the jump throw, but he does not have the arm for that. Then Joe Gray Jr. would hit a line drive at the second baseman, which was caught. And Ramos was then picked off at first base to end the inning. So still 2-0, bottom of the second now. Weiss comes to the plate. Gets a ball into right center field. Strange gives it a dive, but it's going to get past him and roll to the warning track. Joe Gray picks it up, whips it on into the cutoff man. It's going to be a triple for Weiss. After that, the pitcher Gage is going to hit one into center field for a base knock. Drives in a run, 3-0 Altoona as the pitcher contributes to his own cause. Top of the fourth, Stevenson gives another long fly ball that dies at the left field track yet again. Bottom of the fifth now, Colvin back at the plate, hits a ball over to the second baseman, Delgado, who ranges to his left, cannot come up with it cleanly, so it's an infield single for Colvin, as then Suter would then, or Sweeter would then bloop one into center field, allow Colvin to go first to third. Mitchell would come to the plate, pop a ball up to left field, Ramos camped under it, puts it away for the second out, throw to the plate is offline and not in time, as it's now a 4-0 lead for Altoona. Seth Corey then comes on to relieve Sterling Sharp, and he would get a ground ball over to third base, Ruff makes the play easily. Bottom half of the sixth, he's still on the hill, strikes out Miraglio for the first out of the inning, and then Weiss would come to the plate. He goes down swinging as well. Then for the third out, it would be the pitcher Gage who pops one up into shallow right field. Delgado camped under it, puts it away easily. Top of the seventh now, Gilberto Fuentes, last year's first round pick, comes to the plate and hits a ball hard into right center field. That'll get up against the wall. Fuentes has got some speed to his legs and he gets himself into third base with his fleet feet. So he's on third, brings up Tyler Stevenson, who finally gets the hit he's been trying to get all game. RBI single, Richmond's on the board 4-1. to one. And now a pitch gets away from the catcher, allows Stevenson, allows Stevenson to move up to second base. Ramos would then hit a hard grounder at the third baseman, easy out for there. So one down brings out Joe Gray Jr., Absolutely crushes a pitch to left field, but it somehow dies out at the wall yet again. That left field wall just cannot be cannot be cleared in this game. Stevenson does tag up to third, though, but Delgado would pop it up to center field, so nobody comes in to score for the rest of the inning. 4-1 still. Bottom of the seventh, Seth Corey still on the hill. He walks Bay. He'll take his base. One out, runner on first. Colvin then gets a ball past the glove of Fuentes at first, so it's first and second now with one out for Sweeter, who also gets a ball past Fuentes, and that's going to drive in a run as well. It's now a 5-1 to one game. Brings up Mitchell, who is going to pop a ball up in the left field. Ramos camped under it, puts it away, throw to the plate, 
is going to be not in time as it's a sack fly 6-1 ball game. Nick Birdie comes on for the top of the ninth for Altoona with two outs. Tyler Stevenson lofts a ball into center field, bloops right in front of the right field or center fielder for a base knock. And then Elliot Ramos puts a charge into one and they finally clear that left field fence. A two run shot here in the top of the ninth makes it a three run game with one swing of the bat. So with two outs, brings up Joe Gray, who's been tearing up double A so far this season, but not right here. Goes down to the job, third strike. They throw to first for the easy out, and it is going to be an Altoona victory here over Richmond by a score of 6-3. And now it's time to take a closer look at our double-A team. So as I mentioned, Joe Gray Jr. has been tearing up the double-A level. He has the best OPS on the team at a 908. I'm not going to talk too much about him because he will eventually be getting his own prospect profile where we'll be going more in-depth on Joe Gray Jr. Jin DeJang, the thick catcher from Taiwan, 862 OPS, very good OPS, but only in 46 ABs as he is the backup catcher for the Flying Squirrels. Mark Dr. Strange. He was one of those guys who was drafted by an AI team and then not signed, so he was immediately in free agency. I jumped on the opportunity to sign him, so Mark Strange is now a member of our organization in the ad field. He has been very good so far to start AA. 824 OPS, which is the second best among everyday players at the AA level for us. He's a very good player. He's got a good contact bat. He's going to walk a good amount. He's very fast. He's not afraid to swipe bags. He's also very aggressive on the base paths. He's got good instincts in the outfield. He's got the speed to play center. He's got the instincts to play center. But he's got a Johnny Damon arm, so he's more ideal to be in left field. Gilberto Fuentes, he has a 797 OPS. He was last year's first round pick for us. He will eventually be getting himself a prospect profile. I would say he'd be getting one very soon. Tyler Stevenson, 741 OPS. He's currently our double A catcher at the moment, but I view him more of a corner outfielder long term, partly because we have our catcher of the future in Joey Bart, but also because Stevenson's just not good defensively behind the plate and you don't want your catcher to be not good defensively. Ricky Ruff, he was our second round pick in the 2019 MLB draft. To start off the 2020 season, he only has a 712 OPS, so you could say it's been a rough one. But despite the slow start, Ricky Ruff is a guy who is going to be a key part of this team in the future if all things go to plan. He is a very good player ratings-wise. He is an all-around good bat. He's got pop. He's got contact. He's going to walk a decent amount. He's a switch hitter. And then on top of that, he is a very good defensive infielder. He can play all over the infield, third, short, second, wherever you want him. He can play those positions at a very high level. Elliot Ramos, of course, we just did a very recent prospect profile on him. He's got a 660 OPS. Not the greatest start to the year, but we are still early on, so he can turn that around to end his season. Now, this guy, Jose Miguel Fernandez, is someone who absolutely has no future on this team. I purely signed him because we needed more depth infielders in our minor league organization, so I signed him. But I'm just mentioning him because if you were around for the Oakland Athletics franchise at MLB 16, you will for sure remember Jose Miguel Fernandez. He was our everyday second baseman in that series, and he was a damn good player in that series. So throw back to that series with Jose Miguel Fernandez. And Fernandez digs in, still does not have a hit in the postseason, as the pitch number one is in there for strike one. So there, Bettis' day starts off with a high strike, fastball. So one count to Fernandez. Now here comes the pitch. And Fernandez gets all of that one. Jose Miguel Fernandez with a solo shot over the right center field fence. Leads off the game with his first hit of the World Series. And now moving on to the pitching side of things for the Flying Squirrels. Sterling Sharp, who was acquired in the uh, Gerardo Parra and Tony Watson trade to the Nationals last year. He's had a solid start to the 2020 season, a 3.13 ERA, 3.81 FIP in 63 and a third innings pitched. Obviously didn't pitch the greatest in-game in the actual game we showed, but he is still having a good year in AA. Jay Groom, also decent start to 2020. The plan for him is still to be in AAA by season's end and then maybe compete for a starting rotation job in 2021. 
Tim Kate was the other prospect who came over in that Parra and Watson trade. He will be getting his own prospect profile, probably at some point in 2020. But if not 2021, because he is a guy who is at least a couple years away from the big league level, he is having a good start to 2020, though. Seth Corey, our left-handed reliever, is back at it again, being a good reliever for us. He's got a 1.06 ERA, a 2.79 FIP, and 34 innings pitched. He's still only 21 years old, so he's got some time to improve before he's even really in his prime. And uh, Seth Corey could be a guy, if he keeps pitching like this, could get some looks at the major league level, but he does have a lot of of improving to do at certain ratings. But even though Seth Corey has been an impressive reliever for us, TJ Trejo has by far been the best reliever in all of AA. He's got 29 strikeouts and 18 innings pitched. He's got a 1.50 ERA with a 0.0 FIP. I cannot even put into words how insane it is to have a 0.06 FIP, and TJ Trejo is doing that because he is so damn good. He was our fourth round pick in the 2019 draft. He's 19 years old from the state of Rhode Island. He is on the fast track. He is dominating double A as we know. He's gonna be in triple A very soon. And if he plays well in triple A, if he pitches well, if he dominates triple A, or even if he pitches well, not even dominating triple A, I would say there is a very, very, very strong possibility that he's going to be in the big leagues by season's end as, an, as a 19-year-old freshly drafted guy in the previous season. This will be his first season in the organization because he is just that good. At least he's been showing he's been that good. And with that being said, that's going to wrap things up here for this edition of the San Francisco Giants franchise, the minor league update video, the first one of the 2020 season. I've been your host, Jerseyborn, and I am saying... Everybody should watch Days the Confused.